Right, I make that 2.30 by my clock, so good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to this AVC Wise hosted uh, webinar. Now I know actually technically it's no longer Pension Awareness Week. We did start doing uh, some of these generic presentations last week and obviously uh, today is, is uh, everyone who comes under Kent Pension Fund is eligible to be part of this one. But we thought it was quite timely given the fact that recently you should have received your annual benefit statement uh, as I say, to run this uh, a webinar, which is entitled, uh, What Does Your Pension Statement Tell You? Uh, my name is Jonathan Kempson. I'm one of the workplace implementation managers at AVC Wise. And prior to joining them in uh, 2018, I was 20 years with the Prudential. And uh, as you know, in Kent Pension Fund, uh, Prudential is one of the chosen providers uh, by the local government pension scheme. Uh, board to to offer things called AVCs or and of course what your respective employers have done have, have actually launched the latest version of, of local government ABCs what we call salary sacrifice shared cost ABCs I've got many years experience dealing with all these matters to do with uh, uh, local government uh, and want to just as I say pass on some of my knowledge this afternoon but firstly and primarily around uh, your your pension statement. So what are we actually going to be covering today? Well, as I said, really, it's about focusing on your LGPS um, statement. What we're not going to do, just to be really clear about this, is go through it line by line, bo box by box. Pension statements are pretty dry uh, things at the best of times. Um, what we want to do is really tell you what we think are the important things you should look for, but then obviously the kind of things you should perhaps consider reflecting upon as a result of what's actually on your LGPS statement. But essentially what you need to understand is how much you'll get and, and when, and we'll sort of tell you the key boxes to look out for really. Um, and then ultimately, if you have any gaps in your planning, um, or you'll simply need more money. Well, what are your options to try and increase things within the local government pension scheme? We'll touch on those top up options as well. So without further ado, let's go straight into your pension statement. So uh, these are just some uh, uh, sort of boxes which we've managed to um, uh, extract from an annual benefit statement here and of course the key thing really to focus on well first and foremost is that date the 31st of March each year so each year it looks back and says right as at the most recent one obviously being the 31st of March 2021 this tells you what your total annual pension is up to that point and you'll see in the brackets there it has including the care and final salary benefits now how you build up your local government pension scheme has changed in recent years and uh, no matter when you joined all of you are now in this care scheme or the career average revalued earnings we'll show you a graphic and sort of summarize how it's changed and when but essentially that number that total annual pension is literally just lifting the the bonnet to see well what have we got un under the bonnet at this point in time as at this 31st of march 2021 of course that's not necessarily what you'd get if you retired on that date or even if you could retire on that date because as you know um with the local government pension scheme or any pension scheme uh, currently the earliest you can retire and take benefits under normal health is 55 and the latest by the way is 75 so you've got that sort of 20 year window and in amongst that of course you'll all have your normal pension age and moving forward that is now the higher of 65 or your state pension age that so depends upon your date of birth doesn't it so uh what this does and you know that you know if you take your local government pension scheme before your normal pension age if you're doing that of your own volition there would of course be reductions then put on your pension so when you look on your annual benefit statement and it says 31st of march my pension is x that doesn't mean that's technically what you could get on that day because you might not have even been 55 and even if you were that wouldn't take into account any of the reductions which would then be in play if you were taking it of your own volition. It really is just a temperature check to say, look, given your length of service, and of course, if you've transferred some stuff previously in, um, this is what you've got literally under the bonnet, hypothetically, at that point in time from a pension perspective. It will also 
tell you what, if any, uh, lump sum you've built up or automatic lump sum. And as we'll see shortly, remember, you only get an automatic lump sum if you have membership in one of the former final salary sections of the local government pension scheme, what we call the 80th years. So if you've joined um, after April 2008, the bottom line is that box will be zero in terms of lump sum. It only refers to membership of one of the final salary sections. Uh, did you get an automatic lump sum? So that's a sort of snapshot. And really, I mean, that's the sort of so one of the key data boxes you want to understand. Well, this is what I've got at the moment. Um, and then, of course, it, it tells you about what we call your death, death in uh, service benefit. Of course, you know. <laughs> excuse me, your, your survivor can get a pension up to 50% of, of the pension uh, you were going to enjoy. And of course, there's the death in service, the death grant, as it's called. This is the one-off uh, tax-free lump sum, which can be paid out as well. Uh, if you haven't done so already, make sure you've got an up-to-date nomination form completed with Kent Pension Fund to express your wishes. They're not legally binding on the fund, but in 99.99% of the time, they'll pay out whoever you've nominated uh, uh, on the death grant. So for me, the sort of the, the key box is, well, how much pension and automatic lump sum have I got at this 31st of March? And then, of course, <coughs> what it will then do is actually break down uh, this, this section into the care section and then ultimately the final salary section. And it also tell you the level of pay which was relevant for each um, section. And uh, they sometimes can be different numbers um, for the uh, career average section because now essentially all of your earnings are pensionable. Uh, for the final salary sections, uh, things like overtime, unless it was contractual overtime, that wasn't pensionable. So sometimes there can be a differential in the in, in the level of salaries uh, uh, used there. But essentially, all it's doing is trying to explain to you, this is what you've got under the final salary section. This is what you've got under the care section. Now, all of this stuff, as I said, you don't really need to understand it's it's there for technical and it's absolutely right it, it's present uh uh for, for audit purposes for data purposes but at the end of the day you just need to know well what is the grand total overall and uh and when and as i said <coughs> what the key thing is is then after looking at that um uh, projection through to your benefits it will take whatever your you've built up you know, as at the 31st of March, but then it will then ex assume service continues through to your normal pension age, whatever that is, depending upon your date of birth, your state pension age. And it will then project that forward, assuming no salary growth. It will just take whatever salary you're on at the moment. If you carried on earning that all the way through to your normal pension age, 65 66 67 whatever it is this is what you're on track to get and this is your projected lump sum as well and your survivor's pension so uh you know you know that if you're not really on the cusp of your retirement you're going to take the projection with a pinch of salt because of course the hope and ambition is between now and retirement you get some type of pay award um, and it could well be uh, you know you take on more responsibilities a, a bigger role in in L lgps or, or or not but the further away that is then the less realistic the projection is if you're relatively close to your normal pension age then the projection is is probably going to be there or, or, or thereabouts. It tends to be the case that the pay is largely fairly static in the, in the rundown to retirement. Or even if, of course, you know, uh, you, you, you taper yourself into retirement and you, you wind down your hours, well, because now you're all in the career average scheme, that may well not have that significant effect on your end, uh, end pension anyway. But certainly uh, for me, you know, the key things are understanding what you've got under the bond at the moment. And if you carry on doing what you're doing through to your normal pension age, what are you on track to get? And yes, there is all this detail between the different career average sections and the final salary sections. 
in many ways, you don't really need to uh, necessarily take that all on board. So one way of sort of graphically explaining it is just to summarize all of you for service after the 1st of April 2014 are in the Career Average Revalued Earnings Scheme. Um, so how that works from that date forward, you get your salary, whatever that is, 1 49th of that salary is the amount of pension, guaranteed pension you've just built up for your retirement. So you move on to the next year, whether you get a pay award or not, it's 1 49th of the salary that year. So you're building up layers or, or strata of pension income. That's then actually revalued by CPI. That's a really important thing, especially if you've been watching uh, the news at the moment. We're, we're heading into a bit of choppy waters with with with, uh, with inflation at the moment. As we're seeing, it um, could be causing uh, some significant issues for utility bills. Or if you tried to fill your car up recently at the pump, you'll know all about uh, uh, fuel inflation. Now, the good news is, and that's why it's so great to be part of LGPS, is that your pension, which you uh, you bank, your secure guaranteed income, is then indexed linked up by CPI. Never it's been more important to be in a scheme which has some form of inflation linking, which LGPS does. Um, so you get that banked revalued pension. You'll have so many 49ths, and that will give you your pension at your normal pension age, which now moving forward, as I've said, is the higher of 65 or your state pension age and then if you've got service before then between 1st of April 2008 31st of March 2014 you will be in a final salary section as well and those were known they were known as the 60th years so how that worked is if you worked one year full-time you've got 1 60th of whatever your final salary is now, the good news is that the final salary is not frozen when this section came to an end on the 31st of March 2014. They've kept the link up until you retire um, as to your final salary. What is frozen, of course, are the number of years and days you've got under that scheme. But as I said, that ran for six years. If you were full time over that period, you have got six sixtieths of whatever your final salary is going to be. And that's all about giving you pension. And then, of course, those of you who also got service before uh, April 2008, so anything up to the 31st of March 2008, that was also a final salary section. But that's what we call the 80th years. So exactly the same principle as the other section, except that an 80th isn't quite as generous as a 60th, is it? When you cut the pensions cake into 80 slices, each slice isn't quite as big. But work one year full-time, one eightieth of final salary, pro rata down if you're part-time, that gives you your pension, but also crucially the 80th years gave you that automatic lump sum on your annual benefit statement. So if you've got a sum of money, whatever it is, uh, um, uh, as an automatic lump sum, that tells me that you must have some form of uh, service under the 80th years, otherwise it's going to be a zero. So I hope that that makes sense. That's why there are so many boxes and so many numbers, because it's giving you that breakdown. As I said, you just need to boil it down to the grand total, really, how much and when. <clears throat> and of course, when you get to your retirement, whenever you decide within that, that, that spectrum, um, and this will be shown on your annual benefit statement as well, is that you can take up to 25% of your LGPS pension benefits back as tax-free cash. And, uh, you know, it will show you your standard benefits. And then if you want to, you can have the maximum, the 25%. But here's an important point when it comes to the annual benefits statement. They will never take into account, as in they being Kent Pension Fund, will never show on your annual benefits statement whether you have had the wisdom to do any additional saving into something like a shared cost AVC. So if you've got one of these extra pots of money with the PRU, that is never shown on your annual benefit statement, nor is it factored into the calculation when it allows you to exchange pension for a tax-free lump sum. Because for a lot of you who do shared cost ABCs, of course, you're trying to be extremely savvy because you know if you cash out your shared cost ABC pot at the same time as your main local government pension scheme, if the value of that prudential pot fits inside the 25% limit, you uniquely can have all of the ABC back as tax-free cash. And what that means is that those members then 
don't have to damage their pension as much because irrespective of um uh, you know whether you've got abcs or not on your annual benefit statement it will just assume it will give you an option to have your pension at retirement and for every pound of that you give up you can exchange or commute that into in, on a one to 12 ratio so that's the deal you give a pound of pension up permanently they'll give you 12 pounds in tax-free cash up to this limit of this 25 percent and your annual benefit statement will only show you that in isolation it won't allow you or it doesn't show you rather it doesn't show you the potential to actually fill that 25 percent up with an abc pot okay uh, and then preserve your pension it just assumes that you're cancelling your pension for the maximum lump sum now whether that's a good deal or not to do it that way on the screen well if you took average life expectancy how long you might be around in your retirement it doesn't represent that good a deal why because not only was that guaranteed income paid month in month out year in year out in your retirement so if you live to 100 plus you are still going to get that one pound of income on top of that the, the key thing the key point about lgps pension is its index linking and to buy it something which is index linked at the moment would probably be uh, suitably or reassuringly expensive to do so you get that as an automatic feature of your pension so if you think you might be around 20 25 years plus in retirement uh, trust me you'll you'll thank your lucky stars you kept uh, an income which is automatically index linked and uh, rather than just cashing out for the quick win on tax free cash but my point is actually you can actually have it your cake and eat it too in lgps because you can preserve that very valuable pension enjoy uh, the fruits of your labor in that sense but actually still grow your tax-free cash and that's if you uh, have the wisdom to invest in things like shared cost abcs um let's have a look at a quick case study then um so we've got sarah here well let's assume a couple of facts normal pension age state pension age 67 uh when she gets there or it's on projection of twenty nine thousand six hundred odd pounds uh, the next thing would be, well, how many 80ths have you got, Sarah? Well, just one year in the 80th scheme. Six years under the 60th scheme. That must have been full time. And then in a forward looking statement, 18 years under the career average scheme, uh, the care scheme. Um, so 25 years overall. Uh, how much pension are you going to get? 14,900 odd pounds plus an automatic lump sum not much because it's linked to her 80th pension of course that's why it's relatively modest so annual benefit statements or projections um, to normal pension age give you the hard facts and uh, as i said i don't know whether any of you on this webinar have actually gone through a, a financial advice process with a, uh, your own advisor yet or, or not but but typically the structure around an advice process would be or should be well give me the hard facts as in how much and when so there we go Sarah we know that your pension is projected to be 14.9 a year a little bit of a lump sum and that's at 67 and then you get your hard facts and then what you then overlay that are what I call the soft facts so okay Sarah um, talk to me about your retirement um, when do you want to retire? Um, is, is that your state pension age? Uh, well, I don't know. Well, uh, maybe like the idea of going a bit earlier than that. Okay, well, how much earlier? Why, why, why do you say that? And uh, as I said, uh, as someone who's been in the industry um, for a long time, the most powerful question I would ever ask a client would be why? Because why gets me inside of uh, the client's head and tells me what they're thinking and what's driving um, their thoughts and emotions uh, and ultimately uh, their, their financial objectives and a good advisor is about someone who can see the world through your eyes and then guide you and provide the most professional advice and it all starts with this annual benefit statement to get how much and when and then well how do you feel about that well talk to me about your retirement what do you want to do when you stop work well, i've got some hobbies i like doing this i like doing that well one day i'd love to go traveling again here yeah, once i we get over all this covid stuff uh okay well what does that look like then what is the budget for that and you start to build a picture 
as to what the income requirements are in retirement. Are you a homeowner? Have you paid off your mortgage? Do you, do you have a car? Do you intend running a car in retirement? What other capital expenditures? Uh, do you own your home? Have you finished paying your mortgage? Are you looking to downsize? You know, um, uh, and the whole idea is trying to take what's on your annual benefit statement, but then continue that journey overlaying what's important to you and when as to see whether you've got enough to do what you want to do. Or is there some kind of disparity there bet between the two? Oh, and that's on the basis that you actually um, want to work through to 67 because you actually ask most members when you'd like to retire. And uh, most members would, would, would probably say, well, before 67, if I could afford to. And again, very powerful drivers, which make um, perhaps Sarah want to retire at 64 or, or why I might want to retire earlier and why you want to retire early, earlier. And, and, and this goes to the core of, well, if I'm sufficiently um, concerned about achieving that objective early retirement, then I'm more likely to actually put a plan in place to actually achieve it. Um, so, you know, we know the numbers at 67. By the way, 64, jump off the boat three years early. You're in for a bit of a shock, Sarah. Um, a huge shock, actually. It's going to drop by almost four grand. Well, why is that? Why has it gone down so much for going 36 paydays early? Double whammy early retirement off your own back. One, loss of accrual. You're missing out on your 49th, which is quite a big slice of the pie. On top of that, Kent Pension Fund will put in actuarial reductions. Well, we weren't supposed to pay this until 67. So if you want us to pay it at 64, this is what you're looking at. And there comes then a keener conversation with Sarah about, well, actually, now we're looking at 10,800 odd pounds. Um, we've now got to wait another three years before your state pension kicks in, which is separate, which was going to be additional income, maybe another eight odd grand uh, potentially for you there. Again, now talk to me about your numbers uh, at 64, what you want to do and all the rest of it. The reality is, it, it, it is that most of us will have what I call a planning need to save more for our retirement. Just being an active member of LGPS um, isn't likely to satisfy all, all income and uh, wealth requirements uh, through, throughout retirement. Um, but as I said, it's an individual, but it all stems from your annual benefit statement, giving you those initial hard facts. And then of course you can go into pension portals and run estimates for early retirement to start getting these numbers to then start this sort of thought process, whether that's just your good self on your own, or maybe if you need that help, you go through a financial advisor to start that planning process around what is the right age to retire, what's, what's the like, right level of income, given what your particular objectives are one day when you stop work. So if you have got a gap, you know, what, what, do, what are the options within the local government pension scheme to try and boost things a bit? Well, firstly, you can't you can't do added years. We did have someone on a webinar the other day who was actually still doing an added years contract. Must have started a while ago because only existing contracts are still honoured. That ship has now sailed. Uh, if you want to go back to Kent Pension Fund and buy what are called additional pension contributions, basically you're buying extra income directly from the fund. So you've got the security, uh, um, the guarantee and the index linking. Um, you're unlikely to do it though, an APC contract. Um, why? because they're expensive. You are asking someone to give you a guaranteed index linked income for life. Well, guess what? They're going to base the cost on that um, average life expectancy. And the thing is, with your main core contribution you pay in, depending where you're, where you're on the salary scale, your employer on average pays in about 19 odd percent. When you're doing APCs, there's no employer contribution. So you carry the cost on your own shoulders. You'll get tax relief on the cost if you're a taxpayer. And as I say, you are buying the index linked income. Um, but the reality is what you need to do is get your calculator out if you get an APC contract and work out, well, how long have I got to live in my retirement before I effectively recoup the cost of buying this stuff in the first place? Individual calculation, but on average, you're probably looking at least 15 odd years into retirement before you uh, even break even in some cases long, longer than that so you're playing the long game uh, um, uh, there they're also not particularly flexible because 
whilst you can pay it all in one big lump sum, most members will spread the costs throughout a month, monthly period. You can select that contract period. If you want to stop that at any time, you can. They'll pro rata down whatever service you built up to that point or whatever pension you built up to that point. But then if you want to restart, it's a new contract. And because you're a bit older, inevitably, the cost will, will go up. Um, so there are APCs. They're really for the most uh, risk averse members who want uh, come hell or high water guaranteed index linked income. But hopefully they understand the cost and the break even period before they, they sign up for that contract. If you are going to do additional saving, um, then you're far, far more likely to go down the shared cost ABC route because of its relative flexibility. As I said, out of public sector schemes, only LGPS members can even potentially take all of their shared cost ABC back as tax-free cash. Uh, often heard the old adage, sounds too good to be true. Well, I'm here to tell you with more than 23 years experience that you absolutely can. If you take it at the same time as your main scheme and within limits, you can get it all back tax-free. And for those members who don't do shared cost ABCs, um, you are genuinely missing a very, very valuable tax tip to improve your wealth for retirement if for whatever reason you don't do these things. Um, they are flexible. No one tells you what to pay into it. Little as two pounds a month. Some of you can even pay as much as sixty odd percent of your salary in a month. Uh, you'll be surprised what some members pay into these things as they get close to retirement. What they do is they think outside the box about how they fund these things because you can only pay out of your monthly salary. Some members actually then do some very large contributions as they get close to retirement and then live off that savings account, which is now uh, being eroded quite significantly. Uh, by inflation, if you're sitting in cash at the moment, uh, cash ISAs are 0.01% on some of those. Well, if you've got headline inflation at, what was it, just under 3.5%, uh, your money is slowly but surely evaporating before your very eyes. So uh, if I put it into a pension pot, I can get double tax breaks and then potentially go get it back tax free. So that's why I'm going to do large contributions into my shared cost ABC if I can afford to do it. I get tax relief on my anything which comes out of my monthly salary. Oh, on top of that now, I get national insurance contributions uh, or NIC relief as well. Double tax break. And because your personal allowance, how much income you can earn tax free has now been frozen for the next five years. What that means for all of you is that if you um, get any type of pay award, even if it's cost of living, you will be paying more tax in the next five years. And we also saw the other day uh, national insurance uh, proposal to go up for next April, another 1.25%. So uh, again, how could I shelter some of my hard earned money? Um, well, the answer is quite simple. You put it into shared cost ABC because you shelter it for both tax and national insurance. Uh, what it means, basic rate taxpayers, £100 in the pot, that goes on your application, off your pay slip only costs you £68.12 a month, 46.8% return on your money. You start to see why some people do do these large contributions close to retirement. The green arrow tells you why they do it. And if you can get that all back tax free, oh, it's not guaranteed the hundred pounds, by the way, as you know, it's an investment. It can go up, it can go down. You can get less than what you put in, but um, you know the providers, whether that's uh, you know Standard Life or Prudential uh, in, in Kent, uh, they're, they're going to have to do an appalling job with your money before you're out of pocket because of what the tax man's given you. And of course, if you're interested in these things, no matter how close you are to retirement, uh, the ABC Wise calculator is there on the ABC Wise website, and you can actually punch in whatever your respective salary is your tax code, it'll work out the gross and the net cost, and then even do a forecast for you. So if I did that for one year, five years, uh, it assumes that after charges, it's grown by 3%. Um, that's not unrealistic unless you're in a cash fund. You're not going to get 3% of cash at the moment, but it'll actually roll up what that potential pot uh, could be if you do these things. Further resources after today, uh, we do lots of webinars, a lot more detail on these things with the calculator I've just mentioned, bite-sized videos. These are all on the ABC Wise website, and there's a frequently answered questions section uh, uh, as well for your respective employers. If you're after information on your main scheme, um, 
certainly generic information uh, is on lgpsmember.org. That is the go-to website in England and Wales, all things to do with local government uh, and uh, comprehensive uh, information on there. Some calcul Their own calculators are actually on there as well. So definitely worth spending some time on the lgpsmember.org website. If, however, you know, you're actually after specific help around your annual benefit statement, maybe you're querying or challenging what's been put on your uh, annual benefit statement, uh, then I, you need to go back to Kent Pension Fund. OK, so, uh, you know, you have a self-service portal. We'll have the link up uh, shortly. But always remember that Kent Pension Fund is reliant upon your employer sending accurate and timely data to the pension fund to produce your annual benefit statement. And guess what? Sometimes mistakes are made. We had a webinar earlier where someone said, actually, my final salary uh, um, service doesn't look right, just doesn't ring true. Um, it was showing zero and basically they had been there and, and been an active member of LGPS. So the best thing to do is you know, pick up the phone to the pension fund and, and challenge and query and ask them uh, why, why, why do they think that box uh, is blank or whatever the reason is. Uh, so where can I, I go then? Why, why would I be talking to ABC wise and how would I do that? Well, that's if you wanted, we were interested in these shared cost ABCs. Uh, ABC Wise works with your respective employers uh, uh, to facilitate these things. And there's different ways you can uh, contact us, whether that's email, live chat, telephone help desk. We've got our Knowledge Hub calculator, and we've also got bespoke FAQs for your respective employers in Kent as well, if you log into the ABC Wise account. Self-service, remember, any queries around your annual benefit statement, then there it is, kentpensionfund.pensiondetails.co.uk. And you'll be able to log in there and see your annual benefit statement. And of course, you should be able to run some estimates as well. A lot of self-service. This, this is the future sort of digital platform for you to uh, uh, get all that documentation and run your own estimates as well. And then if you're after sort of generic stuff around, well, how does my local government pension scheme work? then lgpsmember.org is the place to go to. Right, well, let me just uh, switch screens and let's have a look at some questions um, which have actually uh, uh, come in. So first question <coughs> from Michelle, is the death grant only paid while in work or is it paid during receipt of your pension? So uh, it can be actually paid in the first now, now this is testing one, either the first five or 10 years. If you die in the early years of retirement, so let's say you die in year one of retirement, okay? Um, the balance of, of the guarantee period, there can still be uh, a death in service payment. And uh, that was either five or 10 years. I'll try and Google that, but that's because uh, I haven't had a chance to look at the questions in advance, but it can pe potentially be paid in the early years of retirement and obviously it is paid if you don't get to retirement uh, michelle do make sure though you've got that up-to-date nomination form completed with your wishes they're not say legally binding on kent pension fund but if your personal situation has changed it's always a good idea to have an up-to-date uh, nomination uh, form completed um steve's asked hi what are the act what are actuarial reductions so basically it's a pension fund saying so in that example you know we we saw that a pension had dropped quite significantly and from 14.9 down to uh, less than eleven thousand a year um some of that is because you've missed out on the 49th but some of it is actually a pension fund saying it's a penalty for going early because if you think about it if you suddenly if you were the pension fund and someone comes to you and you say, well, you weren't supposed to pay out a pension until the member was 67. And now someone's come to you at 64. Uh, please give me my pension now. Well, clearly, the average life expectancy of a 64-year-old is greater than a 67-year-old. So you're going to be having to pay the pension for a bit longer. So you're not going to keep it at the same rate. So you are going to do these what we call actuarial reductions. It's not a linear thing, but if you wanted a very crude rough idea how much you lose of going each year early if you work between four and five percent a year for each year you want to go early it gives you a, 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 a rough idea as to what you're looking at so if you want to go five years early you could lose a quarter of your pension 
So it, it, it's pretty significant stuff. <coughs> um, in terms of Nikki's asked, yeah, what percentage management costs are we looking at for shared cost AVCs? So you've got two providers in Kent. Um, that's Prudential and Standard Life. OK, and um, how it works is that, you know, the, the, the money is invested within a range of fund or funds. You get to choose which funds you want to go into. But those funds, each fund will have a different annual management charge. Typically, the prudential ones range from 0.55 percent a year, whatever the pot's worth, up to some of them are a bit north of one ish percent. Uh, standard life tend to be a little bit more expensive, hovering around the one percent ish uh, annual management charge. And that, and remember, those AMCs are taken come rain or shine, whether the fund goes up or down, the insurer will still take their cut. Um, what I would say, there are no charges from, just to cover this one off from AVC wise, um, we just facilitate it. We provide the digital platform to um, uh, you know, do the application, but we don't invest any money. So you as an individual member don't pay anything towards AVC wise. How our professional fees are paid is that they're taken out of the uh, national insurance savings which your respective employers will make so you don't have to pay anything uh, it's just whatever the relevant amcs are with the providers as i say um at the top end it's about one ish percent but, but a lot of the pru ones pru cash is 0.55 and some of the others about 0 0.67 0 0.7 percent on the pru um stephen's asked i'm in the care pension scheme does having full years have any benefits I, if, I, if I was to leave before the 31st of March any year? Um, no, no, in a simple answer is uh, no, it doesn't, Stephen. I mean, they, they, they do calculate it, obviously, to, to the, you know, um, uh, yeah, every day you're in the scheme. It does take into account that. So it's 149th of you know, whatever you've earned up to the point you leave. And obviously, if you've been in it a year, you know, obviously, then you've had a full full year salary. So, um, you know, it, it, it sort of um, is what it is. It, it, it is also, of course, if you step down in hours, um, you know, if you did that in the last couple of years before retirement, it probably wouldn't have that big an impact because remember, it, it's one forty nine. The what you earn each year is the amount of pension. Uh, so, having a whole whole year, well, yes, it'd be better to have a whole year than less of a year, but um, it probably wouldn't make a huge difference. In all fairness. Um, Angela's asked if someone paid in fifteen hundred pounds a year into the fund, how much would my employer pay in each year? Cool. What do you think the answer is to that, Angela? Uh, I'll tell you what the answer is. It's um, zero. Um, however, I mean, okay, because I mean, if you do any extra stuff, it, it's you and the tax relief. Now, how it is shown on your pay slip, though, and I can perhaps understand why you've asked that question, is that when you do shared cost ABCs, on your pay slip, you're only paying one pound. The balance comes across as an employer contribution. So you might be under the illusion that it's actually your employer paying into it, or it's actually not. That's how, that's what you sacrificed off your pay in the first place. Um, so, uh, yeah, whilst technically on your pay slip, it says an employer contribution, Basically, you, you paid for it all. But the benefit to you is that if you're a taxpayer, you'll save income tax on it and national in, national insurance. Um, Annette's asked, uh, can you continue to make contributions into a LGPS scheme if you've left employment or it's frozen? Uh, again, Annette, the, what do you think the answer is? It's a big fat no. Um, it's because, uh, you know, you've got to be an active member. Um, uh, you know, got to be employed to build up benefits in LGPS. You've got to be employed and active member to pay shared cost AVCs. So, yeah, you can't sort of leave employment and then say, oh, can I voluntarily carry on paying in even if it was the employer contribution? Uh, no, they just, um, uh, you, you can't do that, I'm afraid. Um, and then, oh, good question here from Brendan. Uh, what is the 50 50 section? So, this is for. Um, members who, if unfortunately they were facing financial hardship, um, there is a school of thought which says, look, don't opt out of the scheme entirely 
I mean, I can't speak for any numbers in Kent, but uh, but I know from some other pension funds I've dealt with, you'd be amazed the number of members who say, no, I'm not going to be in the scheme. Now, there might be some, as again, some very solid reasons why they can't afford to do it, you know, but there's a school that say, don't opt out of it all because it's such an important part of your benefits package that quite apart from your salary and your good pension scheme, go in the 50-50 scheme, which uh, pay half, get half. So you pay half the level of a fully fledged member. Yes, you build up half the amount of pension, but hey, look, something's better than nothing. And, um, you know, it's probably easy for me to say that, but I, I probably, you know, whether I'm sure you all appreciate it, but I'm, I know there are a lot of members who don't realize what an important part of your benefits package is that apart from your salary, you're in the local government pension scheme. A lot of members will just say, right, I'm out entirely. And yet they're doing themselves a real disservice. And even if they are facing financial hardship, um, you should try and go to the 50-50 scheme rather than opt out of it entirely. Um, David's asked, is it possible to draw down the ABC early, e.g. 64 years and access LGPS at normal retirement age 67 to avoid reductions? Brilliant strategy, David. Yeah, so what you've got to do here, because there's something called pensions freedoms. You know, there was a guy called George Osborne. He did something pretty revolutionary when he was the chancellor. He said, look, if you've got some money in a pension pot, I'm not going to force or compel you to buy a financial product, which is what you had to do previously. He said, you just go and blow it on a, on a sports car if you wanted. And that's why all the, 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 the red tops were saying, Oh, you know, everyone's going to have a Lamborghini moment with pensions freedoms and all this nonsense. Um, but it was a very significant um, thing he did because pensions freedom say that when you get to 55 currently, if you've got a pot of money, you can just flexibly access it. Now, how it works in local government and local government ABCs, well, you look at the rules and regs around LGPS and they're very clear and they say, well, look, if you want to get money out of the ABC, you've got to cash in your main scheme. And you think, well, I might not want to do that, as you're thinking, David, because each year I get uh, I go early, I get hammered on my main scheme. So I tell you what I want to do. I want to go early, but I want to defer taking my Kent pension because I want to avoid those actuary reductions. But I'm still have a need to live off some money to help bridge the gap. So I want some money out of that former AVC pot. Now, how you get round it is you simply take the money out of whether it's pre or standard life you're with, you transfer out of that AVC, that shared cost AVC pot, and you move it to effectively a personal pension. Okay, so if you transfer out, then under pensions freedoms rules, you can then flexibly access the money. And I see more people doing that who want to retire early rather than taking it the hit on the main scheme transferring out now of course if you've done that then you might not potentially be able to take that pot all as tax-free cash because remember if your strategy was to take it all as tax-free cash at the same time then you've got to cash out your main scheme but then you've got to accept some damage to your main scheme uh, if you're going before your normal pension age so hopefully that that that, that makes sense there uh deborah's asked um if i retire in january 24 and I'm paying £30 a month in an ABC, would I benefit from increasing my payments to £50 a month? Would this be worth it? Well, I guess um, uh, I guess the answer to the question is, um, you know, whether you pay tax and national insurance. Um, you know, I mean, I think if you are a taxpayer and you're paying national insurance, then any increment you do is only going to increase those savings a, a, a bit more, aren't they? Um, uh, you know, and, and then you've got options to then potentially take that pot back as tax-free cash or, or not, you know. Um, so that's, that's entirely a, a personal uh, perspective for your own, but increasing uh, uh, savings into pensions is highly tax efficient, yeah? And I think given the fact that uh, your personal allowance is, is going to be frozen for the next five years. So you're going to pay more income tax if you get a pay rise. Um, uh, you know, things like putting money into pensions is going to be more attractive uh, for members, especially ahead of any national insurance increment as well. Right. Um, that's about it on the, on the question front there. But there's some really good, uh, really good questions there. So um, only remains for me. Oh, I think one more has come in. 
Um, Grace has asked, if I decided to take any of my private pensions earlier at 55 before the AVC pension and the government pension kick in, kick in would that any effect on my LGPS pension? Right now, here's, that's a really good question, Grace. So a word of warning, you know, I've just talked to you about pensions freedoms, how, you know, you get to 55. If you've got a personal pension, you can cash it in and go and buy a Lamborghini. Well, you're going to need a pretty big pot to do that. But uh, you, you know what I'm saying? Um, you've got to be careful if you're still an active member of pensions. So you, let's say you, you, you're you still in Kent, you're in the building up your LGPS benefits, you've suddenly turned 55. Um and then you've suddenly uncovered an old personal pension and you've suddenly heard, oh, I could just cash that in and go and have some fun with it. Uh, and you go and do that. Well, think very carefully before you ever cash in a pension pot if you're not retired, because you might have triggered something called the Money Purchase Annual Allowance or the MPAA. So when we pay into pensions, we have a normal annual allowance, which is 40, 000, up to 40,000. 40,000 pounds a year but if you cashed in things like personal pensions uh and then you're still active member other schemes you're trying to have your cake and eat it too in fact that the government is the opinion you could take some of that money and potentially then recycle that into another pension and try and get double bubble on the tax man so we're, we're we are very wary of that so that's why money purchase annual allowance would cap your contributions at four thousand pounds a year moving forward rather than forty thousand so because pensions when you invest in them they're free of in, they're in an environment which can grow free of income tax and free of capital gains tax my biggest steer to all of you is that if you've got extra pensions elsewhere leave them until you really really need them um, because of that favorable tax treatment but also because if you do access them, then if you were still an active member of other schemes, you could be impacted by something called the money purchase annual allowance. So just be careful of that. That's a good question. I like that one. Um, okay, uh, I think that's about it, folks, uh, for for this Monday afternoon. Um, let's see if I run over a bit on time, but I'd much rather. Oh, one more, one more. Um, yeah, David's asked. Uh, not to end on a morbid note, but an important question, David. Um, what happens to your ABC pot if you die before you access it? Does it go to your estate? Yeah, so you know, we were touching on about the um, uh, nomination form, which hopefully you've all completed with Kent Pension Fund for your death in service benefits. Well, that nomination form would actually cover off your ABC pot. So whatever was in the pot at date of death would effectively go back as a tax-free lump sum in addition to your three times salary death in service and they would just look at your nomination form and the pension fund would very likely just give it to whoever you're nominated on your pension fund as well so so uh, the good news is the money's not lost it would effectively go to whoever you're nominated under your your main scheme of course the bad news is you didn't get it but of course uh, importantly it was at least passed passed on and uh oh yep yeah. Christie's asked, you can do your nomination on, or not ask, it's a statement. Yeah, you can do your nomination online via the website you promoted earlier if people haven't done it. Thank you very much, uh, Christy. That is an important thing. So, yeah, log on to that, you know, Kent Pension Fund, your pension details thing. And you used to have to do these in the old days with paper. But, yeah, you can now do it um, uh, online nomination. So uh, make sure you have, you, you've done that. And my suggestion is to um, even redo it if you can, even if your wishes haven't changed. Because one thing they would look at if something happened to you is they'd say, well, so-and-so filled in this, this nomination 15 years ago. How do we know they were still their wishes? And of course, uh, you know, over the course of life, um, uh, your personal situation might change. I always remember back in those days when you did face-to-face -face presentations, and I was talking about that in in uh, one session, and one lady looked uh, quite distressed by it all, and I, I asked her whether she's all right, and she said, I just realized my ex-husband's on the nomination form. So I said, well, hopefully you're going to get to the end of this session and make it to somewhere where you can update your nomination form. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, do, do go online. Uh, that's the easiest way to do it.
Okay, right. Uh, we will uh, wrap it up there, folks. Look, I got. Hope you got something out of the session, uh, even if it's. Look, I'm going to look at my annual benefits statement. Um, I'm going to look at those hard numbers, and then I'm going to start thinking about moment situation, how much uh, and and when. Uh, I assume, uh, you know, I recognise those forecasts. Don't assume any salary growth and all the rest of it. I perhaps I'm going to go online to the pension port portal now. Up, up, so update my nomination form, run some estimates, uh, challenge any numbers which I don't think are quite right for me. But I want you to think about, you know, your retirement and, and think basically, you know, have you done enough saving for your retirement? Um, if you have, great. If you want to be more tax efficient, look at those options you've got with LGPS, you know, and uh, take advantage of, of things like shared cost ABCs. You're the only public sector scheme which can do this. And more than that, your employers have allowed you to do that. And uh, you can actually shelter significant sums perfectly legitimately and increase your wealth for your retirement by looking at these things. Anyway, thank you very much uh, once again. And uh, good afternoon.